Welcome everyone and uh, welcome back to our lecture on quantitative risk management. Um, we've now reached chapter 3, Monte Carlo simulation, which will be a very short um, section. Uh, and probably today we'll also start talking about time series analysis and how we can use time series analysis methods um, to model uh, financial time series, financial data, and then make forecasts. Um, so that we can, uh, first of all, forecast those financial data time series and then calculate uh, profits and losses based on those forecasts. But first of all, uh, we want to talk a little bit about Monte Carlo simulation. Um, I'll give you a short overview and some motivation and then uh, we'll look at the inverse transform uh, sampling, which is the actually really the basis for all um, Monte Carlo simulation. Um, why is it called Monte Carlo simulation? Well, I've already given you this, um, this um, example that if you have random distribution uh, and you throw um, maybe one or two die, um, well, this is one way of generating random numbers, random observations uh, from a given statistical distribution. And because uh, the easiest example you can think of is maybe a game of roulette or throwing a dice, um, this is obviously connected uh, to gambling and uh, the uh, statisticians and mathematicians who came up with these methods immediately thought about uh, Monte Carlo being a famous uh, casino uh, in Monaco. Mm. Now, what are we looking for in Monte Carlo simulation? We want to model the probability of different outcomes. Um, especially when an analytical treatment is difficult or simply not possible due to model complexity. Two things here. First of all, uh, Monte Carlo simulation is always about generating random observations from a given um, distribution. Uh, that's always the case. That's everything and anything in Monte Carlo simulation. But when do we rely on simulation methods? Well, usually when we want to calculate something that is based on a statistical distribution, which we don't really know analytically. So we cannot, for example, calculate the mean or the variance of a certain distribution for some reason. It's too complex, the model is too complex, uh, or we don't have uh, the exact uh, formula. But what we can do in many cases is even though we don't have the, the, the model formula, we know how to simulate observations. And what we do then is we simulate enough observations, we repeat this process, we plug in these random observations into our model, and then we try to approximate uh, the parameters or the moments that we are looking for. So a very simple example could be we have a distribution, we want to calculate the variance of that distribution, but we don't know the exact distribution. We don't know uh, the an analytical formula for the cumulative uh, or density function, um, the cumulative distribution or density function of the distribution. For some reason, we only know how to come up with random observations. Then we do a calculation via simulation. We simulate random observations. We plug it into um, the formula for the sample variance and then approximate, um, then we, uh, uh, sorry, we approximate the variance based on those simulations. So this is uh, something we do and we can do this for the expected value. We can do this for the variance or the value at risk for quantiles, um, for anything that is based on that, um, for, on that distribution. Now, all Monte Carlo methods, in, in fact, rely on the strong law of large numbers, uh, which simply tells you that uh, if you have enough observations, x1, x2, xn, and so on, of a population, uh, and if you calculate the sample mean, sn, this here is the sample mean, that's my cursor, this is the sample mean, it converges to the expected value in the population. So we have a difference between the population, which is x, and we have samples, x1, x2, x3, and so on. And the sample mean, which is Sn, converges to the expected value f, uh, e of x in the population. The same thing actually for the sample variance. So if you take the variance of Sn, 
you can see that it actually has to be adjusted. We talked about this in an earlier lesson that um, you cannot simply take the same formula for the variance and uh, calculate the variance from the sample, but you have to make a slight adjustment. Um, so um, you can see that first of all, uh, SN, the sample mean uh, is, um, is uh, an unbiased estimator for the expected value. If you slightly change the uh, common formula for the variance, um, you get an unbiased estimator for the uh, population variance. And if we now look at the variance of SN, of the estimator, you can see that actually here, um, we see that by increasing N, this, the variance of the estimator goes down. So again, increasing N, increasing sample size, and uh, the estimator SN is improving and improving and actually at a rate of one over the square root of N. Much to say about basically only a very small thing here. Um, take the sample mean and the strong law of large numbers tells you that the sample mean is a good estimator of the expected value. And uh, this is one foundation of Monte Carlo simulation by simply by increasing uh, the sample size, the size of uh, the observations you have, uh, you can get close to the expected value in population. So next thing we need to talk about is the inverse transform sampling. What is inverse transform sampling? Now, simulating random samples from various distributions is based on the inverse transformation method, the inverse transform sampling. Uh, there are different names for this. Um, and what we need first is we need to define the pseudo inverse of a cumulative distribution function. We've already seen this uh, because in some cases it might be that you cannot invert the cumulative distribution function it needs to be continuous for that. Um, we have to define a pseudo inverse that is always defined. And the pseudo inverse F um, uh, arrow here is given by the infimum of all those uh, real numbers X for which the distribution at X is smaller or equal than U and U is between zero and one. So U obviously is a probability and uh, the smallest number so that the distribution function is lower than this probability. This is the inverted pseudo quantile or pseudo inverse of that CDF. Now, inverse transform sampling is then based on the following theorem. Let X be a random variable with F being the cumulative distribution function. And we have a pseudo inverse F arrow then let u be distributed according to a uniform distribution on the closed interval from 0 to 1. So u obviously will be um, probabilities between 0 and 1, random numbers actually. And if we define y being equal to the random variable u that is uniform on the interval from 0 to 1 being plugged into the pseudo inverse, then we can see that actually y is distributed just as f. This is just the CDF of x, meaning what? You can actually get to the distribution f if we know it, if we know that, if we know f, obviously we're done, but we can also get a random variable y that is distributed according to f as the same distribution, simply by doing what? We need to calculate the pseudo inverse and we need to plug in, we need to enter values from a uniform distribution on the interval from zero to one. Now, this is very simple, actually. This one here, the uniform distribution on zero to one, that is simply a random number generator. That is simply a random number generator. Uh, you can find it on each of your own calculators. Usually all modern calculators have this random number generator function. And then you simply need to plug it into the pseudo inverse. But also means, first of all, we have to generate random numbers. And we need to know the pseudo inverse of this distribution f. So these are the two steps. And on this slide, you can see how this actually works. If the blue line here is the probability density function, 
it corresponds to the CDF and to the pseudo inverse. So the green and the orange lines, those are the um, cumulated distribution function and the uh, pseudo inverse function. And what then happens is you take a value of x, which might be normally distributed. Uh, you get to this probability density. Um, we have the uniform uh, distribution here, so it's mirrored. Uh, and then you can find this point here. And if you plug in the random number here, you can do the opposite. So this is how we can simulate this x based on a uniform number, uh, on a uniform, uniformly distributed number between 0 and 1, and by plugging it into the inverse, the pseudo inverse of that particular distribution. Now, let's assume u, u1, u2, they are all IID distributed uh, according to the uniform distribution on 0 to 1. Um, now, for any, for most given um, distributions, uh, you can actually uh, look up the generator that is the pseudo inverse. And what happens is, for example, for the exponential distribution, x is given by minus the logarithm of the random number divided by the parameter lambda. Now for the Poisson distribution, a random number can be generated by taking the infimum of the natural number so that minus one divided by the parameter sum of k equal to one up until n plus one of the logarithm of uk is larger than one and so on and so on. So for each different distribution you have a different generator you don't need to memorize this all these generators are um, actually programmed in all common statistics programs in r etc uh, and for the standard normal distribution actually we have the so-called box muller transformation which is slightly um, well it's slightly easier and has a special name but as you can see uh, for a an, an uniform distribution, u1 and u2, x and y, they are given by the square root of minus 2, the logarithm of u1, times the cosinus of 2 pi times u2, and so on. So you can generate numbers from a standard normal distribution. Uh, continues here for a student t, log normal, normal distribution. Obviously, each generate, I know, each distribution has a different generator, but it works all the same. Hmm? Okay, so some applications. What can we do now with Monte Carlo simulation? We'll see many applications later on, but here are two very simple examples. Hmm? First example is the calculation of value at risk. Let alpha be between 0 and 1, that is being a confidence level. Then you might remember from financial risk management or a different master's class that the value at risk at confidence level alpha is given by the smallest number L for which the probability of a loss capital L exceeding the number L is not greater than one minus alpha. So it's the infimum of L so that the probability that you incur a higher loss is smaller or equal than one minus alpha. That's the common definition of value at risk, meaning that it's the smallest number L so that you don't that the probability that you incur a loss that is higher is smaller than 1 minus alpha. And one standard procedure to calculate VAR is now Monte Carlo simulation. You might have heard this in other lectures that you calculate um, that you calculate value at risk using Monte Carlo simulation. What you do is you choose a parametric model for the changes in a risk factor x t plus 1. Could be, for example, that you say x is a normal distribution, normal distribution with 0 and 2 plus a high squared so it's there, uh, with parameter 5 uh, divided by uh, a t distribution with parameter 3. We don't know the analytical formula for this distribution. You can try to calculate it, but it's probably very difficult. So you don't know how to calculate a quantile. The value of risk is a quantile. You don't know how to calculate the quantile of this distribution x. But what you can do is you choose a parametric model. We've done this here. So this is the first step. We then calculate and calibrate the model based on the historical 
uh, data. We, we've already done this. This is how we came up with those parameters. So the second step is actually also done, calibrate it or make assumptions on the parameters. And then we need to simulate m independent values from each of these distributions. And when we plug in those observations in this formula, we get random observations, simulated observations of x. And then we can calculate the ensuing financial losses and then calculate value risk based on the empirical distribution function of those simulated observations. So that's Monte Carlo simulation for calculating value at risk. One advantage is that you can basically choose any distribution model for your risk factors and your financial losses. So this makes um, Monte Carlo simulation very, very attractive and very flexible. You can choose M sufficiently large. So the number of observations should be chosen, say 100,000, 200,000 observations. So there shouldn't be any uh, variation in your estimators. The problem is that this can be um, very comp computationally very um, difficult. So you have a high computational effort, a high computational burden, and you need um, powerful computers to do this. And it might even take those powerful computers a lot of time uh, to process all this um, information and to come up with these. Uh, this is very simple, actually, but to calculate those random numbers, 100, 200,000, especially if you have more complex financial instruments in your portfolio, for example, derivatives um, or other types of uh, financially engineered uh, contracts. So that's a disadvantage. Um, some options. Let's go to the second application. Uh, in some cases, uh, we do need Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, for rather complicated path dependent uh, options. So the exotic options, we'll come back to this later in chapter three. Um, it might be that um, you need to calculate the stochastic process uh, and then calculate path, simulated paths of that stochastic process and plug it into the payoff function of that particular exotic path dependent usually option. Then you calculate the payoff and you calculate the arithmetic mean of those payoffs as an estimator for the expected value of the payoff of the option. Um, we have that part in the lecture computational finance, but um, you need for this to work, you need to simulate observations from that stochastic process for this Monte Carlo simulation in option pricing to work. So this is a second application. And last but not least, uh, more generally, it might be that you are interested in calculating uh, an integral of a function using Monte Carlo simulation. And on the following two or three slides, we have a very simple example, a very generic example in which you can use um, Monte Carlo simulation to calculate an integral that might be very difficult uh, to calculate. And it might also be the case that this uh, integral cannot be um, represented analytically. So what would you, uh, should we do? Mm. Imagine and consider the integral i being the integral from 0 to 1 over a given function f. Very, very simple integral, but we don't know anything about the function f. Now one can calculate the integral in a non-deterministic way using a random variable u that is uniformly distributed on 0 to 1 on this interval. And we can write the interval being what? This is actually um, the expected value of the uniformly distributed function u being plugged into the function f. And we can then estimate that expected value based on the arithmetic mean of simulated function values. So let u1 up until un be independently drawn observations from the uniform distribution. And it now follows from the strong law of large numbers that um, the limit of 1 over n of the sum of these function values g of ui is actually equal to or converges to, one has to say because this is a limit, uh, it converges to the integral from 0 to 1 over g of x dx. So we can calculate the um, integral over g by looking at the limit of this, um, actually of this uh, sample mean. So as you can see, um, you can use 
um, Monte Carlo simulation to calculate any given uh, integral. Now, in computational finance, we can see uh, in the lecture in computational finance, we see that uh, th for simple univariate one dimensional integrals, this is not the best way. This is way using way too much computer effort uh, to do something we can do with a uh, smart math. But however, in the multi-dimensional case where we have integrals uh, of functions in two, three or even more uh, variables, then Monte Carlo simulation suddenly might be useful. It might also be the only way to calculate those integrals. Yeah? And this is a very simple uh, example in R where you have a function f that is x taken to the third power minus 0.5 times x squared. So this is the function we want to integrate. Um, we initialize a vector of calculated integrals. We set seed at seven and uh, we simulate data from the uniform distribution, plug it into the function, and then we calculate the arithmetic mean and we plot the results. So we do this 200 times uh, and with an increasing number of observations. And actually the result is here. Now this is the Monte Carlo integration of this function. And as you can see the blue line here, this is the true result. I mean, this is a very simple function, right? And you can um, you can uh, uh, immediately analytically calculate the stem function, the inverse of the derivative, calculate the true um, integral. This is the blue line. And as you can see, with the increasing number of observations, Monte Carlo simulation gives you a result that immediately starts to be closer to uh, the blue line and it stabilizes to some extent around the blue line. And it's not perfect. For this very simple function, obviously you don't need Monte Carlo simulation, um, simulation for integration, but you can see that with just 200 observations, this is also very quick on a computer, you can get a good approximation to the true integral. And this is how you can use Monte Carlo simulation in a very generic way um, to calculate integrals. Do you have any questions on this short chapter three on Monte Carlo simulation? It gives me an opportunity to drink my coffee. Okay, so it seems you don't have any questions. Then let's continue uh, with our chapter four time series analysis. Now, again, we start with a short introduction. We then go to some basic characteristics of time series we see every now and then in financial data. And then after having talked about those characteristics, we build us an instrumentarium, um, a, a toolbox, basically, with which we can try to model those characteristics of financial time series. Now, we use these time series model First of all, to describe characteristics and dynamics of a time series. We start out with models that are really meant for modeling. We are trying to model behavior we can observe in reality, in nature. And <laughs> next thing we want to do is we want to derive unobserved components of a time series and want to extract those um, components. Next thing is we want to calculate smooth series that are meant to extract those components and then see if it's a smooth time series that only contains ideally some kind of noise, some uh, kind of um, systematic noise. And then last but not least, uh, if we've come up with a model that is able to uh, truthfully or at least uh, accurately uh, describe the development of those time series characteristics, we can then try to use these models for forecasting. That's the last step. But first of all, let's define what a time series is. A time series is a realization of a stochastic process. In many cases, a stochastic process and time series, those two terms are interchangeably. The difference is that a time series is something that is more specific and this is well, the difference also is that we uh, sample the time series at equidistant point. So yt, with t being uh, in the uh, whole numbers, uh, y minus 2, y minus 1, y0, y1, y2, at equidistantly spaced points in time, that is called a time series, but 
in the end, it's a stochastic process. The univariate time series can then be represented by a sequence y1, y2, up until yt, or simply in short, yt in parentheses with the index t. The random variables yt are assumed to be metric. So we're looking at metric random variables. And remember that a stochastic process is just a set of random variables. And the question now is, do uh, the distributions of yt, y1, y2, y3, uh, do they change over time? Do they not change? Is it stationary? Is it not stationary? And this is time series analysis, basically. And as we only have one realization of the data generating process, we have to impose one stationarity assumption um, go back to slide 139 for a definition, to the process to be able to draw any conclusions. So um, it makes sense to use time series analysis because as you can see from this S&P 500 index level, well, you can see we have trends, we have seasonalities, we have some changing volatility. So many features in what seems to be a stochastic process and this is why we are using time series analysis and time series methods to describe the time evolution of these prices and later on of obviously of the returns. You can see the volatility clusters here more pronouncedly in, uh, in the returns rather than the index values. Okay, so we start with some unobserved components models, uh, some very simple things and probably the simplest trend model one can think of is being that yt, uh, the observation at point t, is given by a trend dt, this is a deterministic time trend, plus a stochastic stationary component that is noise. So we have a trend, could look like this, let me just see. Could be that we have just a trend. And the actual time series looks like this. It's not the trend, obviously, but it's the trend plus a little bit of noise. The stochastic behavior of this process is simply generated by UT. So more precisely, we should show that this is actually, if I can go back, maybe we should write it like this to indicate that ut is a random variable, dt is deterministic, it's not random. So this is the simplest example of a trend model. Um, and we can then next turn to include a cycle, a seasonal pattern, a different stochastic component. So this is what we do next. There might be additional components in this time series rather than just a trend. It could be that it actually like this, could also be that it's like this, and the actual time series looks like this. Oh, we have a seasonal trend, but again, obviously some noise, and this is what the time series looks like. So next step, we include a seasonal component, ST, to the simple trend model, and the stochastic pro component, UT, is often assumed to be white noise. Go back to slide 140 in subsequent ones, that is basically, right noise, stationary, uh, normally distributed, in many cases, normally distributed um, um, process like this one here um, that introduces the stochastic behavior to the otherwise deterministic one. So if we were to leave out UT, um, well, then we wouldn't have a time series. It would simply look like this or like this. And this would be uh, and it would be easy and very we will be able to model and forecast this process 100%. So we need some stochastic behavior and that is introduced by white noise that is added to the seasonal and trend component. Now a typical goal in time series analysis to, is to extract the unknown components DT and ST. Now what does it mean? It means that well we have some assumptions on the noise and we want to filter out the noise and then look at what does dt and st look like so that is time series analysis extracting the unknown components dt and st from the time series yt okay 
So what can we do? To determine now the seasonality and the trend, we usually proceed in two ways. We calculate estimates for DT and ST. We make assumptions and estimate DT and ST. And what we do then is if we subtract, let's write this down. If we subtract from YT, uh, DT minus ST, what are we left with? Well, actually what we are left with is we should be left with an estimate of UT, the noise. And what we then do is we calculate the residuals U hat T given by the, uh, the process that is observable minus the estimated trend and minus the estimate, estimated seasonality. And we can gen then check whether these estimates, these estimated residuals, whether these fulfill the assumptions we've made on um, the white noise process. If UT is a white noise process, well, obviously, then these estimates are accurate. If this is not a white noise process, if there is still some trend or seasonality in this process, well, then probably our estimate for the trend or the seasonality, they were not correct. So we adjust a stochastic time series model to the trend and cycle adjusted time series under the assumption of stationarity. And then we check the residuals. A second possibility for transforming a given time series into a stationary one is to remove the trend and cycle component by applying the so-called lag operator. What is that? Well, if we have a linear trend, one can easily obtain a detrended time series by taking yt minus yt minus 1. If, for example, it looks like this. Sorry. And it looks like this at a second point in time. So this is y, sorry, yt, and this here is yt minus 1. Then obviously, taking the difference, applying the lag operator, that is yt minus yt minus 1, will give you what? It will give you the white noise process. So you've detrended this time series because the trend is in both time series. And this one should look like this. Yeah. And this should look like this white noise process. Okay, so that's the second possibility to check whether detrending and taking out the seasonality is sufficient um, to do a proper model. Now, to determine the trend component, one can employ so-called moving averages of polynomials. And for the former one, estimates dt equal to beta 1 hat times yt minus 1 plus beta 2 times uh, yt minus 2 and so on. And for the latter one, obtains an estimate for the trend component as dt hat equal to parameter b beta 0 plus beta 0 times t plus beta 2 times t squared, and so on and so on. And this is how you can calculate um, an estimate for the trend using moving averages of polynomials. Now, um, let's take a different time series and see what we can do with this. Uh, this is obviously not a financial uh, data uh, time series, but this is this is coming from marketing. This is German retail sales. But you can see that it has it is obviously random, has some uh, randomness in it. We have seasonalities. But we also have a huge trend here at the end. So trend, seasonality and some white noise or some noise at least. Uh, and what we can do is we can first calculate the first year, one year moving average. So you can see this here is at any point in time taking the previous year and looking at the one year average. What you get is this gray line. You can see it smoothes out the noise to some extent. We can then take the retail sales minus the one year moving average. As you can see, it then looks like this. Uh, could say that it has 
some seasonality. Now we take the one year moving average minus the five year moving average of German retail sales. This looks like this. Again, we can now clearly see uh, a rather smooth curve of the seasonality. And basically you simply by going to the, um, by taking the one year and five year moving averages, you can extract those main components, especially if we argue that this is not rather a trend. This is also seasonality. This is just a very long season, maybe like this. Uh, we can actually by simply by looking at look at like this, by looking at one year and five year moving averages, you can smooth out the noise. And what you get is the seasonality component. Yeah. OK, we will see this in more detail as we move along and we get more complicated and more uh, flexible models. So let's um, continue with the characteristics of time series. <laughs> we start out with the expected values. Very simple. Uh, a time series obviously also has expected values and the expected value function mu of t is defined as the expected value of the time series at point t. We then can define the covariance function uh, gamma of t compared to t plus k, which is simply the expected value of the time series at point t minus the expected value at t times y t plus k minus mu t plus k. Very simple. Um, based on the covariance function, we can then obviously also calculate the autocorrelation function, which is just the covariance function divided by um, the product of the square roots of the variances or the standard deviations. So this gives us the autocorrelation function. Why is it called the autocorrelation function? Because it's not the correlation between, say, uh, x and y, but rather it is the correlation between uh, y, t and y, t minus 1. If you were to calculate the covariance between y t, uh, y, t and y, t, you would then obviously get the variance of uh, the process at point t. Okay, expected value, covariance and autocorrelation function. Now, um, we can, using these um, these moments of um, the time series, we can then define certain properties and we call a time series weakly stationary, schwach stationär, if the following conditions are met. First of all, um, we have a constant expected value. So mu of t is set to mu regardless at which point we are looking at. Second, the correlation, the auto, um, no, auto covariance function. The auto covariance function only depends on the lag k. Same with the auto correlation function. They only depend. Uh, it only depends on the lag k. So um, it means that if we are looking at a time uh, line here, um, let's say this is uh, zero. And this is oh, I have and so on. This would mean that the correlation between zero and one is the same as the correlation between one and two or the correlation between four and five. The correlation, however, between zero and one and the correlation between zero and two, they are different because we have a different lag. This is a lag of one and this is a lag of two periods between those two variables. So autocorrelation and autocovariance only depend on the lag. And if the autocorrelation, autocovariance only depend on the lag k and we have a constant expected value function, then this time series is called weakly stationary. Why is it weakly stationary? Well, you see, uh, we all always have the same expected value. Well, it probably looks like this. And we can see it, uh, the autocorrelation is only depending on the lag, but not on the point in time we are looking at. Okay, now let's consider a random walk. A random walk given by what? We start out at zero. Um, and the next observation, y1, is zero plus 
noise. The next value is the previous value plus noise. And ut is the noise that is iid uh, with a normal distribution. So this is white noise, strict white noise process. And the interesting thing now is that you have now learned a new stochastic process, a so-called random walk, meaning that you start at this point and the next point is based on this point and we add some noise. So we might go up to this point. And then the next point depends on this point here and it goes down. So, so this is a random walk. Okay. We want to simulate paths of a random walk. We set seed again at seven. We want to simulate 100 steps. We need three paths to simulate. And it's very simple. In R, what you see is here, we take R norm to simulate one observation from a standard normal distribution. We add it to the previous value of this vector Y, and then we just plot the three things, and this is what we get. This looks very similar to what I've drawn here, but obviously this is much more accurate. So we have three paths of a random walk, and um, they, this is a very simple way to simulate um, a weekly stationary um, process. Is it? Is it not? Let's calculate this. We can now take those three observations, those three paths, and let's think about it. what do we need? We need an expected value that is constant and we need autocorrelation and autocovariance that only depend on the lag. So let's look at this. It's not weekly stationary. Why? Let's look at yt. yt is given by yt minus 1 plus the noise. This is again yt minus 2 plus noise. So if you continue to do this, what you get is yt is basically the starting point plus uh, basically infinite sum of all those white noise processes that are added on in each step. So u1 plus u2 plus u2, 3 and so on. Thus, we have the autocovariance the variance between t and t is the variance of yt. This is the variance of this process uh, y0 plus u1 plus u2 and so on and so on. Then this is given by the variance of, because y0, does anyone, maybe to, um, to include you in the lecture, does anyone know why the variance of y0 disappears? Why we can leave this out? y0 is a constant. It's not stochastic. It's deterministic and thus the variance of this deterministic term is zero. So we only need to concentrate on the variance of u1 plus u2 plus and so on and so on. And via the equation of BNME, uh, you can show that this is the variance of u1 plus the variance of u2 plus plus plus. And because this is iid, this is actually t times the variance of u1. Uh, the variance of u1 is given by sigma squared and thus the variance at point t is actually t, the point in time, the index times the constant uh, variance of the random term. And thus as the auto uh, variance or the variance at point t depends on t, the second condition on 2, 2, 3 here the second condition is actually violated. Um, so if k is 1 or k is 0, you can see that even the variance changes. It's not constant. No? Uh, and this is actually um, a side effect here. Um, I cannot, I can, let's say gamma of t, t plus 0. This is gamma of 0. Uh, it needs to be constant. Well, that's not the case. It depends on t. Yeah? So uh, gamma of t, t plus zero, it doesn't depend on the lag zero. It depends on t. So this second condition is implicitly violated by this process by a random walk. So it's not weakly stationary. Then in the stationary case, we can obtain an estimate of the autocorrelation function by taking the observations by calculating the sample mean and then calculating 
uh, row hat um, as a function of k. And given that some additional conditions are fulfilled, we know don't need those, uh, row k is a consistent, uh, actually there's a hat missing here, this is the estimator. Uh, this estimator here is a consistent and asymptotically normally distributed estimator for rho. And you can then um, represent this graphically and we call this graphical representation of the autocorrelation, the empirical autocorrelation, the so-called correlogram. And this is um, the empirical autocorrelation function of the green simulated path of random rock from slide 2 to 7. So, uh, 2 to 6 actually. So this is the green simulated path and you can now calculate the correlogram that is take those observations and calculate the different autocorrelations for different legs. It's given for different legs and as you can see there is uh, a non-constant odd empirical autocorrelation. Does anyone know what the blue lines is? Well this is the confidence interval. If it were simply in between here we would consider it not to be statistically significant, but as you can see, it is sti statistically different from zero. Same here. So no, um, the autocorrelation is not zero um, and it's not constant. So unfortunately, no. Let's have a look at the empirical autocorrelation function of the S&P 500 returns. Interestingly, um, the autocorrelation is extremely high at this point and then suddenly drops to values that are close to um, statistically indifferent and insignificant and not statistically significantly different from zero. Does anyone know why we have a very large uh, value here at the start? Any idea? Use the chat window please. No idea. Uh, this is by definition. Um, obviously the autocorrelation of xt with xt is uh, the correlation is one because you're looking at the covariance uh, which becomes the variance. So the correlation at point zero is one by definition. Okay. So empirically, at least for financial market data, it looks like autocorrelations of the pure, the raw returns, uh, those autocorrelations are close to zero. We'll come back to this point later. So let's now talk about some selected time series models we can use next on. Uh, we've already seen moving averages and we'll start with moving, simple moving averages, which can be used to smooth a time series or to remove a seasonal or cyclical component. So the simple moving average is defined as the unweighted mean of the previous n data points. That is, yt uh, is given by 1 over n um, times the sum of all those previous n minus 1 observations. So you have the average of the previous n observations and you simply take the average and then you move this average as you go along. For example, you calculate this average, it might be here, and then you take this average, and this average, and this average, and you move the averages along the time series, and this is a simple moving average. And as one can see on the following slide, the number of considered lag value functions, or no, the, the number of considered lag values functions as a smoothing parameter. So if you only use the last two observations, then obviously uh, it's not a very smooth curve that you will get. But if you say, okay, I'm using the last 500 observations, you will smooth out all those small ups and downs. So this is done for say the one year and the five year moving average. And again, you can see uh, you can smooth out all those small ups and downs and you get a smoother curve. Now in the following we restrict ourselves to time series with expected value equal to zero that is we set mu t equal to zero and one possibility now to model this time series autoregressively meaning that the previous value 
drives the next one, as we've seen in the random walk, uh, we come up with an autoregressive model. And the general definition of the autoregressive model is yt is given by the previous value yt minus 1 times a parameter alpha 1. And this here is the autoregressive model, the random walk we've seen before. If we now add the stochastic noise at the end, we get the random walk. We want to make it more general, so we also include the um, observation before that, and maybe before and before, and p periods before that. And every time we include another value, we have another parameter. So this model is called an autoregressive process of order p. So this is an AR1, AR2, ARP process. And the ARP process is stationary if the absolute value of every root of the polynomial p of lambda equal to 1 minus alpha 1 times lambda minus alpha 2 times lambda squared and so on is greater than 1. So you have to calculate the roots, the zeros in German, die Nullstellen, of this polynomial. And if you see that the root, every absolute value of every root is larger, is greater than 1, you know that this process is stationary. However, in practice, this is very hard to difficult and very hard to verify because uh, the polynomial gets quite complicated. And then we can move on to a moving average process and then later on combine the two to an autoregressive moving average model. So a moving average model is now what? We are now looking at not the observations of the process itself, but we are looking at the different noise terms on the stochastic term ut. And what we are doing is we take those realizations of the white noise process and we then uh, take moving averages of ut minus 1, ut minus 2 and so on. And this is the moving average model uh, of order q. So we take the last q realizations of the white noise term or the white, the, uh, let's call it the error term more generally. And then this is a moving average model of order q. Uh, this MAQ process is always stationary. And then let's combine this. We take an autoregressive moving average process of order P and Q. This is an ARMA PQ process. That is, the process, the time series is given by, we have a parameter alpha zero plus the autoregressive component plus the moving average component plus the error term UT. And the armor PQ process is stationary if the ARP part of the process is stationary, obviously because the moving average process is stationary, the AR process needs to be stationary. And this is done by looking at the polynomial P of lambda here. <coughs> Sorry. Now the question now is, this is a very generic, very general model you can use. And you need to decide on uh, the order P and Q. And the optimal order PQ of the AMA process is determined based on the values of the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation function. It doesn't make sense to use, say, an ARMA 1010 model if we have too many parameters and we don't need that flexibility. Actually, in many cases, an ARMA 11 process is fully sufficient to model financial time series data. So how can we determine the optimal order? By looking at the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation function. So let's determine the parameters of an ARMA process. To determine the parameters, uh, we have um, the Box-Jenkins method, which consists of basically three steps. We first remove the trend and seasonal component by, for example, applying the lag operator, because trend and seasonalities, they are extremely simple to, uh, to, to observe. And by taking the lag operator, trend and seasonalities should be out. So what remains is, it might be that if we see something like this, well, we have already, after detrending and deseasonalizing, we already can see that the remainder is white noise and we are done. If we see that it still looks a little bit like this, it might be that we need an armor process. So apply the lag operator. And then we have to um, determine the order PQ of the armor process. 
based on the values of the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation function. We estimate the model parameters by maximum likelihood or also least squares and then we analyze the residuals. The residuals again just like in the previous case with where we only have a trend component they are supposed to be uncorrelated have a constant expected value and variance over time and then we check for autocorrelation one we have a look at the autocorrelation of the partial autocorrelation function, or we can also employ the so-called Durbin-Watson test. And what we do, do is residual analysis. Again, like in the model with only a trend component, check whether uh, the residuals, what is left of the process of the time series after applying a leg operator, after applying the armor process, if it is really a white noise process. And based on the estimated model, one can then try to forecast. We can then take the model and simply calculate, uh, we simulate um, one observation from the noise process, plug it into the process and continue uh, the trajectory, the path of that process. Okay, so that's an armor process. Sometimes we need even more flexibility. And two of the most widely used models for daily risk factor return series um, are the ARCH and GARCH models. ARCH stands for autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity and GARCH is generalized ARCH. ARCH is due to Robert Engel and is formally defined as follows. Let ZT follow a white noise process and the expectation is constant of zero with zero expectation and the variance is one, also constant for all points in time. Then XT is an arch P process if, first of all, it is strictly stationary and if it satisfies the following two equations, XT is given by a variance sigma T times ZT and ZT square, uh, squared is given by alpha zero plus uh, the sum of um, the weighted squared previous observations of XT. <laughs> What we do in essence is here, we assume for this process xt that it is a variance sigma t times uh, this strict white noise process and we have uh, the variance is given um, with, a, with a special form that is it is autoregressive and that is why the process is called autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. In fact uh, we have heteroscedasticity, meaning variance is not constant, it can change over time. It is condi conditional because the volatility depends on the previous uh, squared values of the um, of previous values of the process, that is on the variance sigma t, and it is autoregressive again because uh, the variance depends on previous values of the variance. So that is an arch process. And in this model, the conditional standard deviation or volatility sigma t is a continuously changing function of the previous squared values of the process. So this model enables us to capture volatility clusters. It is possible if you have a process that looks like this, this um, with volatility sometimes spiking and showing periods of high or low volatility, this is what this process can capture and the name art refers to this structure as xt clearly continuously depends on previous xt minus k so it's autoregressive and the conditional variance changes over time so it's hetero and not homoscedastic and common choices for the innovations of arch processes for the white noise process here it it doesn't need to be normally distributed it can also be t skewed t or skewed t so we can choose different um, different um, distributions for the innovations in an arch process and then gauge is due to tim bolesliff in 86 uh, let again zt follow a white noise process with uh, zero expectation and unit variance then xt is called an arch a gauge pq process if it is strictly stationary if we have the same um, equation for xt being the white noise process times the variance and um, or the volatility and variance being 
not just alpha 2, uh, alpha 0 plus, sorry, uh, the weighted sum of the squared previous values of the process, but also the weighted sum of the previous volatilities and variances as well. So we have x t minus k and sigma squared t minus j in here in the equation um, for the variance. That's a gauge process, pq two parameters. So it's generalized as <laughs> the square volatility does not only depend on previous squared values of the process itself, but also on previous squared volatilities. We can see that obviously a gauge P0 process boils down to an arch process with parameter P. That is a gauge process of order P0 corresponds to an arch process of order P. And in practice, low order gauge models such as gauge 1-1 uh, are fully sufficient to describe the time series behavior of financial data. Now in the gauge 1-1 model, periods of high volatility tend to be persistent since large values of xt minus 1 or sigma t1 may lead to a larger value of xt. And this effect can be achieved by gauge arch models too, but they require higher orders for a similar result. So gauge models are the preferred choice when it comes to financial time series data. And last but not least, by setting the armor error equal to sigma t zt, where z, uh, sigma t follows a gauge volatility specification, we get a very flexible family of armor models with gauge errors combining the features. And this is a, actually, let's write this down, we get an armor, uh, let's say p q, Gauge uh, uh, I J model. So we have an armor gauge model that includes all these features. We have an armor um, armor error and a gauge specification for the volatility of the process. And this is what we will usually use in financial market data. We can also extend the arch or gauge models. For example, we have the exponential gauge E gauge the Glosson, Jagannathan, Runkel gauge, J, uh, GJR gauge, uh, threshold gauge, uh, leveraged gauge, asymmetric power uh, arch, up arch, touch. Uh, there are numerous extensions. Uh, some are m more flexible, some are more restrictive. However, um, there are some papers out there that have tried to compare all those different specifications of the gauge model. And in fact, what they show is in many cases, a gauge 1-1 one, one is uh, fully sufficient to beat the performance of all those extensions. Okay. We can also use these models uh, in the multivariate setting and we then get multivariate volatility models. But I would say that uh, this is pretty much to digest. Uh, I would like to um, stop here. Uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, I would say it makes sense uh, for you if we before we continue to have a look at this uh, example that we have here um, with the real data. Uh, so we have some data, um, the practical example. You can download the data here and uh, if you switch to slides 264, you can download the data and you can do all of this, what I've described now, uh, doing the time series analysis, doing the residual analysis uh, on your own at home. And I guess it makes sense to stop here because the multivariate extension is uh, just a very simple way of just not looking at one, but looking at two or more time series, and then applying the extensions of the armor model, the arch and gauge models, etc. Uh, obviously, we now not only need to look at volatilities and variances, but at correlations and covariances. This is what the constant conditional um, correlation, the CCC, the dynamic conditional correlation, the DCC models are all about. But uh, I would very much like you to get more familiar with the, um, with the different uh, time series models we've talked so far. And uh, as an, a small exercise for, to, um, for next week, uh, for you to do at home, please look at the R models we've given on the slides. Try to do this at home for yourself and try to model maybe a different um, financial time series um, using these models. And in the end, try to find the best fitting uh, time series model, because in the end, this might also very much like 
uh, this could very well be the um, the task you are given in the exam. Yeah. Do you have any questions when it comes to the time series models we've talked so far about? Trending, uh, detrending, um, seasonalities, AR processes, MA processes, armor PQ processes, arch and gauge models. Um, because if you don't have any questions, I would say we stop here with the multivariate uh, volatility models. Uh, you can try at home uh, your hand at the R programs for modeling time series and then maybe you can you can tell me your experiences uh, when we continue next week okay so I don't see any questions in the chat window so I would say we stop here and uh, I hope you have a nice week uh, and see you next Monday thank you <laughs>